Welcome to Cool Cove. My name is David Benedictus. Hello, I am Daria Ruggles. Hello there, David. So today uh, is actually the third in a show that David and I uh, wanted to do called Beyond Binary. The first show um, was, uh, was this amazing woman who had been uh, raised as um, evangelical Christian homeschooled and, um, and believed that uh, gay and homosexual was wrong, but she had her heart changed when her own child came out to her and then her mind changed when she started to get uh, science-based facts. And then our second interview was with somebody named Mads who's going through the transition and who was kind enough to talk about their story with us. And uh, right, David, this made both of us curious about, you know, what is the history of, of uh, gender and, and when and how did it become unacceptable and, and why, who benefits? Well, it's, uh, in the research I did, it's, it's actually pretty fascinating. <clears throat> All the cross-cultural permutations and variations in, in, the, in indigenous communities of uh, having uh, other sexual identities. It's very fascinating. I'll give that in, the, in I'll get into that in some slides. I'll show you some slides in a minute because it's great to see the imagery. Um, but I just want to pull on the thread um, of, uh, from the first two uh, episodes that we did. Um, and one was this idea that uh, <clears throat> that was that that was in uh, psychiatry up until 1972 that uh, in the DSM-2 uh, diagnostic manual of uh, pathological disorders uh, was that uh, uh, homosexuality and any LGBTQ plus type of lifestyle was a perversion. And then in 1972, that was removed and it became a normal variation. And there's all there's often a conflation between LGBTQ plus lifestyle and um, it being um, a perversion or it being something that is predatory. Um, and the uh, the pred the predatory is a predatory behavior is a is still pathological. If there's a, if there's a power dynamic, if rape is involved or uh, um, age differences with a young young person not not um, able to make their own uh, decisions um, and there's laws around all that but it doesn't have anything to do with lbgtq plus i just wanted to make that um, distinction there and it, it reminded me of my experience as a, when i got drafted and i uh, enlisted in the navy i was off the bus we were all sitting on the floor they were telling us what, what was going to happen that day and um, this, <clears throat> they said, well, you'll go to do this and get that. And you're gonna go here and get a haircut. Um, and the last thing they said was, but one thing before you leave here is that anybody who is gay needs to stand up now. Otherwise, if we find out later, you'll get a dishonorable discharge. And so that was pretty compelling. Now this was 1968. So this was, this was four years before the DSM-2 change. So it was looked at as a perversion. Fast forward a year and a half later, I was stationed at Oakland Naval Hospital, Department of Psychiatry, the psychiatric corpsman, and living off base with my wife. We got married in 1970 and moved into an apartment with a bunch of other people who worked up at Oakland Naval Hospital. Oakland, as you might remember or know, is between Berkeley and San Francisco. So there's a lot of um, culture there, um, <clears throat> long history of culture. And it was a very open, open communities. So uh, I was, I was uh, kind of surprised after hearing that in boot camp to realize that many of the people I worked with were gay. And, and, as, and they were living in an apartment building near me or uh, in our next door, actually. Um, so, uh, and then as we got to know them, know them and we lived in Berkeley and San Francisco, we would then go to the gay bars, to the drag queen shows and stuff like that. And it was a hoot, it was a lot of fun. Um, so there was that dichotomy there. And then actually in 1971, our, we had a big Halloween party 
offered by, uh, that was sponsored by one of the nurses in her home. She was running a home and a couple of the guys came and dragged that. <laughs> Okay, were they the gay guys or the straight guys? The, they were the straight. They were the gay guys that came and drag, and they were hit on by the the, the head of the base, oh. uh, who, who just came in because she was an officer. He came into the party just briefly, and he started chatting with them, not realizing that they were. I don't think that. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's great! I have so to that, ask you one other thing, David. Did it, you know because when you said they had to stand up, did anybody stand up? No, no, no one stood up. No, but I thought about it as a way to get out of going because I, <laughs> because although. And then your I'm, wife comes to get you. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, we weren't, we weren't, you know, we just started dating actually. That I, I just, I just met her a couple months before I went in the Navy. But um, <clears throat> I thought, well, this is a, a way to get out. But then, I, you know, then you have to prove it and all that. So, um, but I thought that that was, a, that was really a, just a, a stunning uh, uh statement you know and and in fact up until uh uh don't ask don't tell was uh was done away with people were discharged with less than an honorable discharge uh if they were discovered they were gay in, in the service so if even under don't ask don't tell i think that was 2015 they did away with that 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 um if you if you were exposed as being in a gay relationship or they found out if they, if someone told, then you would get a general discharge, which has great, which has huge impacts on your ability to use your military career to get a job or, or get uh, VA benefits and things like that. That's all gone now, um, <clears throat> but it's still, but there's still issues with people coming out in the military, and they're still um, targeted, and um, um, they they have issues with advancement and things like that. So I just wanted to just to touch on those two issues, um, and and then I wanted to uh, uh, go into the slides now. So let me see if I can share these with you. Okay. Um, it's Wonderful. fascinating, fascinating, fascinating conversation about all, all of this. I, I was my mind was my mind was blown. So here we go. Hey. Hey. We can see it. So it's a global thing, huh? Global thing, right? It's all everywhere in all in almost every indigenous community on every continent. There, there were uh, third, fourth, fifth, sixth sex uh, socially social relationships within the community that were blessed, that were honored, and the people were fully integrated. Um, and when the Western explorers. Uh, uh, from Western Europe went to these uh, indigenous communities and encountered them. They they were quite puzzled by this and didn't understand it because they were using they were seeing the, the, those communities through the lens of their Western Christian um, ethics. <clears throat> so um, we'll get we'll get into that 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 problem in a, in a few minutes here. But here's a, a, a from a log of a of an explorer uh, James Brook. He's an English um, explorer. And in 1848, he wrote, the strangest custom I have observed is that some men dress like women and some women like men, not occasionally, but all their lives, devoting themselves to the occupations and pursuits of their adopted sex. In the case of the males, it seems that the parents of a boy, upon perceiving him to have certain effeminacies of habit and appearance and induced thereby to present him to one of the uh, elders by whom he was received these youths often acquired much influence over their masters and they were actually as we'll see in future slides uh, part of the ritual and even shamanic uh, communities so that was, that was and this this the, you can see these kind of uh, log uh, entries for portuguese the spanish explorers all of them you know not, whether they went to africa or india southeast asia <coughs> the hawaiian islands so going in the way back machine here <clears throat> uh, back to rome this is a uh, sculpture um that was unearthed in uh, I think about 16 or 1700 in Italy, 
<clears throat> from about uh, 155 BCE. And this was a copy of an earlier bronze. Um, the, the mattress they're laying around is actually added later by, later by uh, an Italian um, a sculptor. Um, but you can see that the, uh, the figure repose has both male and, and female uh, genitalia, female breast and male genitalia. <clears throat> so there was a lot of interest in this. Um, uh, and usually it was incorporated the mythology of Venus and Dionysus and, ba and Bacchus, mm -hmm. uh, incorporating uh, both male and female together. <clears throat> David, isn't it actually a fact, and they call it intersex now, that it, like, is it like 2% of babies born or something like that? It's, no, like, it's about 1%, I think, 1%? something like that, 1% or 2% of intersex, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> um, so that's, that is another, that's one of the um, other genders in indigenous cultures was the intersex as well. Uh, what we now call hermaphrodite. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what, um, and by, the, and what, the uh the 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 western uh, colonialists um often confused uh people with uh who were uh in in a in a third sex or other position they all thought that they were hermaphrodites initially mm. <clears throat> from uh, our own uh, indigenous uh Amer native american non-binary role there were um both there were men that had full female roles and were did all, all of the female actions and dressed um, throughout their life in the female garb and were weavers and caregivers and uh, um, and uh, and cooks and took care of the community. Um, you might, I, I was remembering when I, I saw this, uh, the uh, Dances with Wolves, Kevin Costner movie, they had a, a figure like that in, in, in that movie as well. What I didn't realize <clears throat> was that there were also females in the Native American culture who fully assumed the male role and were actually warriors and went out with the, with the warriors and fought with the warriors fully and were fully embraced as um, males and dressed as males, although every uh, although they were physiologically women, in one of in one of the uh, tri uh, tribes, there was one woman that was um, such a uh, a uh, profound warrior that that uh, she was a, afforded special status as, as a chief, and she had uh, I think three or four uh, female uh, uh, wives. Um, this is uh, in southern Mexico in uh, 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 Oaxaca, I believe that's how you pronounce it, Oaxaca, uh, southern Mexico. And <clears throat> that word M-U-X-E is, is pronounced mushi. It comes from Ujer, a Spanish um, derivation. And these are people that uh, were had male characteristics of birth, who dress and behave in ways otherwise associated with women, and they were seen as the third gender. And this community still exists, and this is a current photograph, was, uh, still exists there, very important in the culture in terms of rituals, singing, and in parades, and are often, um, they, they, it's very interesting that a lot of these relationships, there they may have relationships, same-sex relationships, but it's not viewed. It's not viewed as homosexual. It's just viewed as an expression of that third sex. It's, so, as you can see here, there's there's a whole different way <coughs> that um, indigenous um, approaches to sexuality and non-binary sexuality. Uh, clash with the Western uh, mindset and psychology. They didn't fit into the confined Western registry of gender binaries, heterosexuality, and uh, in the, um, as many people know from their history, is that the when the uh, Western missionaries came into those cultures, they saw that as version uh, drawing on the, the scripture that they had of, uh, from Leviticus and other tracts that uh, homosexuality was an abomination and was against God. 
<clears throat> so they totally um, rewrote the laws in those cultures um, to make that um, punishable by imprisonment and sometimes death. And I can't help but feel, uh, you know, the, the the hypocrisy and the exploitation aspect of that. that. Then they went about enslaving people, and and then using that authority by which they're saying the way that you're doing that harms no one is an abomination. And oh, by the way, we're going to enslave you, and we're going to use this book to say it's okay. Yeah, um, and in all those cultures, also they wiped out the language. Often wiped out the language and forced them to speak uh, whatever uh, the language was of the uh, the uh, invading missionaries, Spanish or English or whatever. So, and that that's well documented in Native American culture um, for sure. They uh, there's all these stories about sending the, sending the kids to the um, Western schools and they weren't allowed to to speak their language anymore. Yeah. have any more of the ritual practices because they were pagan and not Christian. Um, so this is this is Southeast Asia, Indonesia. These are the Buddhist people. I probably didn't pronounce that right. They're androgynous and they're priests and shamans and sorcerers. Um, uh, they you could become a man or a woman and and they were thought that because they carried both sexes, they were they they could communicate between the two worlds, between the other world, the gods, the world of the gods and goddesses, and the human world. So they were the intermediaries, intermediaries in their ritual and their mythology, uh, um, and were very respected. And they still exist there in Indonesia and in some of the smaller villages. Um, they're fully accepted. Uh, there's one TED Talks I saw where this fellow was talking about um, uh, that it was this young this man was fully accepted. He was a hairdresser. Everybody greeted him going down the street. He lived in a family. They had children, and it, it was just a, natu a natural experience. Now, these it's, are in smaller communities. It's a much lovelier, more direct uh, definition of intersex. You know, like interpersonal. It's like you know. So, David, do you know about how long this has been going on? Is this like hundreds of years or thousands of years? Hundred, or? Hundreds of years. We, um, we, you can, because there were very few written texts, what they have to do is do carbon dating on drawings and things like that. So mm -hmm. it goes back um, thousands, thousands of years. Oh. Um, thousands of years. Hmm. You're talking about BCE. Wow. Know, wow. Common area. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So that's Southeast Asia, and here's India. Um, they, th this group has been in India for pre-colonial times, going back, um, and this is part of the Hindu culture, the, his Hiraz, and they're respected for being extremely loyal, well-trusted, and given important religious and governmental roles in the community. <clears throat> Again, because of their special place of being able to carry both the masculine and the feminine uh, psychology, the most the masculine and um, feminine um, energies. So, just looking briefly at all these, uh, and I just want to mention in our <clears throat> in one of the last slides, I'm going to bring up. I'm going to show you an interactive map that I found on the internet <clears throat> that has <clears throat> all the cultures around the world in Africa and India and South America. Um, China, uh, Italy, and you can see all of these cultural representations, all these historic traditional cultural representations by clicking on the interactive map. It's really, it's really wonderful. Um, so, um, in fact, I guess we'll do it right now. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm going to stop share of this. And you'll see us again, and then I'm going to share the screen, and we'll go to uh, just a second here. It's pretty cool to see that it's uh, ancient and so widespread. Yeah. And so accepted. Oh, excuse me a minute here. Though. This is a zoom. There we go. Okay. A map of, you can see this. Stop. Yep. Map of gender diverse cultures. Scroll down here. Mm -hmm. And you look at this, 
at the at this map and you click on <clears throat> give me something to click on i'll show you uh hawaii hawaii there it is okay long before cook's arrival in hawaii a multiple gender tradition multiple gender tradition existed among the kanaka moli um, um <clears throat> I'm mangling that pronunciation, indigenous society, the Maho could be biological males, all females and having a gender role somewhere between and encompassing both the masculine and feminine. Hmm. Their social role, role was sacred as educators. So you go, I won't get into any more of this because um, on Zoom it kind of messes up, but um, that is an example of what's out there and we'll include that in the, in the, um, in the end of the program. So people can, uh, can go back to that. Um, so that, that was just so wonderful to see that, that somehow we figured all this out in our, in our small communities, our small pre-industrial tribal communities, indigenous communities. And we had a solution for that. And it was just, that's the way people are. And they, and they figured out a way to fit in and they became part of the community, fully integrated. And, and in fact, we're blessing, they've seen as blessings to the community. Mm. Oh. That, that was just so, after talking with uh, the experience of Jessica and Mads and you know, the struggles that they have in terms of finding community mm -hmm. and feeling safe in community, to see that this is possible to do again as we begin to look at the science and look back at the rich hist rich cultural history that we can pull on these traditions and bring them forward mm -hmm. and oh. re re recreate our communities to be fully inclusive using these as models. I, I just brought tears to my eyes looking at that. It was just wonderful. It is wonderful, and, <clears throat> and I totally agree. And I and I. It's interesting because you don't realize what a straitjacket it is for everyone. I mean, to feel different. And, uh, you know, when we were talking about telling stories and that's a way to connect to people. And a friend of mine said, you know, that the way that she does it is she asks people, how would you feel if you truly felt like you were trapped in the body that was the opposite of what people assigned to you? And go ahead. <laughs> oh, uh, it, it would be horrific. Yes. It, it would be it would uh, it would be so um, uh, dysphoric, so um, uh, uh, I, I guess the word is traumatizing. I was thinking yeah. about as, as Mads and Jessica were talking about. I was thinking about my background in mental health and being working as uh, in trauma, helping people recover from trauma. And one of the th first things you need in recovering from the trauma of being exiled and being seen as other, and then also being targeted and not feeling safe. I mean, so for example, when I worked uh, in mental health in the juvenile court system, um, that I would get a lot of calls. I was the victim um, victim impact coordinator. And I'd get a lot of calls from parents whose kids were being bullied in the schools and the school wasn't being able to address the issues. And a lot of those kids were kids that were vulnerable in this way. Yeah. And it broke my heart because I couldn't get the schools, we couldn't get the schools to address that. And it's still an issue. And um, and then when you look at that, when people do finally have the courage to come out and be authentically who they are and own their bodies and their psychology, that people, they're, they're, people turn their backs on them and they have and target them. And then also say, also give them the feeling like, they're not human and they're going to hell. Right. Now I know a lot of my neighbors think I'm going to hell and you know, because I'm doing programs like this, but we still, <laughs> but I don't talk about it too much. And I just let them say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But can we work on this project in the neighborhood? So, so <laughs> very good. Let's, let's, let's focus on what we can do together. Right. We need, let's get into the school. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting when you adopt a school and you have, you have these multicultural schools like we have and and all this diversity but you have people coming in the schools as volunteers with this kind of ethic and 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 and, and fundamentalist lens it is something we have to be um, aware of as allies that people need protection absolutely i'm hard pressed to call it an ethic i think of it as a bigotry yeah. especially because right. there's such an activity of unacceptance and othering and 
shaming and hatred and it's so vociferous and so volatile in our society, particularly in our society. <clears throat> um, it, it is, um, I think I was reading, uh, one of the uh, resources I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna put in there is uh, resources for military people who are LBGTQ plus. And there's, there's a website for that. And um, one of the things that happened is many of the people that uh, were discharged because they were outed can go back and have their their less than honorable discharge reversed oh, given the Supreme Court decision. Oh, so good. things like that are happening. And this is one of the reasons I wanted to do this program is to is to with with you is to create a community dialogue about this in service of healing and inclusivity and to bring people to resources to normalize this and to, to show people how they can be allies. I, I love that, David. And, and the fact is that you came up with uh, a greater authority in terms of ancient ancient culture and, and also global. So if, if we're looking at the authority as being something that comes in before something that is not nearly as old and, um, and also doesn't benefit, shall we say, uh, a particular group of people with a certain opinion. I mean, it's, yeah. right? Well, the science, right. Natural selection, evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology. Those are the three pillars <clears throat> that we now have available to us that we didn't have back then, but we figured it out until, until we were told that that was evil, it was perverse and, um, and um, now we're bringing that ancient knowledge forward into new open minds, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is part of the science. Um, and it's, so, it's such a breath, breath of fresh air. <clears throat> I wanted to, um, this might be a good time to show you a couple of videos that were kind of interesting that I pulled off the internet about this conversation. And you can see, one of the things you see in these videos is how, how um, damaging this rhetoric is. And uh, a, a well-renowned uh, Christian ethicist who recently, uh, five years ago, uh, changed his mind. He was one of the, uh, he was the Evangelical Baptist Christian. He was a, a president of the, Evan, or vice president of the Evangelical uh, um, Baptist community. David Gushy is his name. He came out because he was he was an open he was open to dialogue and he kept hearing from his parishioners their struggle from the kids their families the struggle and then at 38 his sister came out to him oh. and that just and he loved her dearly and that just changed everything uh his, his i will put his book up it's called changing his minds and <clears throat> changing my mind and it came out of a bunch of blog uh, of um of uh, podcasts that he was doing uh, the blogs and podcasts that he was doing. And of course, you can imagine what happened in the traditional community once he did that. Now, he has 25 books out there and in every Bible study class in the evangelical world. You had a couple of his books. So now he's coming out and saying we need to be inclusive about this. And what he said was, uh, got it here, it just blew me away. This was in a movie that you recommended, by the way, that we should put a link to. It's called The Antidote, it's a documentary on, on Prime Video. You got to see it. It's wonderful about inclusive communities and things that work bringing people together. Anyway, in this film, he says, the anti-LBGTQ plus rhetoric from the church is a weapon of spiritual destruction. You know, that is really powerful. calling, that's very powerful. And he's calling for dialogue and he's being right up there. So check his stuff out. I'll, we'll put the uh, book up there. Um, this isn't David Gushy, but these, these are other pastors um, having a conversation about that. Let me see if I can share these here, okay? So there's that again, and we'll come back to, uh, come on, Zoom. This is gonna be fun. We're gonna see what we're up against, right? All right, so we're gonna do the black pastor first. Okay. Is that right? Uh, well, or you, I think you also, you were maybe, you were gonna, okay, sure, either one. I mean, I think- Okay, here's Anderson Cooper first. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so here's Anderson Cooper talking, showing a video about uh, anti-gay sermon and having a response from a, uh, a, another a minister who has a different viewpoint. Get full screen here, okay. 
A North Carolina pastor recently made news when he advocated, quote, cracking the wrist of your son if he displayed effeminate behavior and also uh, suggested that a father should uh, give his uh, effeminate son a, quote, good punch. When confronted about those comments, the pastor, Sean Harris uh, is his name, said he was joking, was misunderstood. Today, another pastor is making headlines for comments he made from the pulpit last Sunday, also in North Carolina. Charles Worley is the pastor's name. That's him making the sermon. In the sermon, Pastor Worley blasted President Obama for supporting same-sex marriage, but he didn't stop there. He told his parishioners from the pulpit what he would do to, quote, get rid of everyone who isn't heterosexual in this country. Of our president getting up and saying that it was all right for two women to marry or two men to marry, I tell you right now, I was disappointed bad. Uh, but I tell you right there, as you sorry as you can get, the Bible's again it, God's again it, I'm again it, and if you've got any sense, you're again it. I had a way, I figured a way out, a way to get rid of all the lesbians and queers, but I couldn't get it past the Congress. <laughs> Build a great, big, large fence, hundred. 50 or 100 mile long, put all the lesbians in there, fly over and drop some food. Do the same thing with the queers and the homosexuals and have that fence electrified till they can't get out. Feed them and, and you know what? In a few years, they'll die out. Do you know why they can't reproduce? So that's pretty horrifying. <clears throat> yeah, it's almost funny. I mean, if you if you if you think of this person with his use of the English language and his barbaric, simplistic view, it's almost funny. Except for he's serious, right? Or is he going to yeah. come back next week and say he's only joking? Uh, he's not joking. <clears throat> um, he's he's for real. And uh, there's a number of uh, people in, out on YouTube. You can look at the. <clears throat> I have to um, have a glass of wine or something after I watch these videos. It's, it's so upsetting. Um, so let me show you Anderson Cooper's response and, and then um, another pastor responding to that. Okay. And then great. we'll go on to another video. Let's see. I think it's a 224. Okay. Good enough. It's okay. During the sermon, you could hear members of the congregation shouting amen. Reverend Gaddy, you're a Baptist, so, so is Pastor Worley. Does this kind of rhetoric about imprisoning gays, electrifying fences, waiting for them to die, I mean, is there anything Christian about that? I see nothing Christian about it and nothing American about it. In fact, Anderson, it is about as contradictory to a, a religion based on love and acceptance and welcome, as you can imagine, and it violates everything we understand about the Constitution and its affirmation of diversity and freedom for people to live out their identity. So that's enough of that. Yeah. But you see that, that there are uh, faith communities that are pushing back against this literal um, interpretation. And one of the things that was so upsetting to me about that was how how someone who was gay was seeing that is um who's lbgtq plus <clears throat> non-binary would experience that and that is trauma that's how you experience trauma that's like the trauma of racism the trauma of the, any kind of abuse it's it's a demonization of the other <clears throat> it's it's horrific so let me uh here here's a black pastor that has a <clears throat> was giving a sermon and I think this is a, a, a wonderful counter viewpoint. <laughs> and God said to me, here's the problem. You guys in the church can be so hypocritical. He said, in the African-American church, you really got to be careful. I said, what do you mean? He said, because you are guilty of condemning the Supreme Court system and preaching against something. But if you look at half of our choirs, And a great number of our artists 
that we call abominations and we call demons we demonize and dehumanize the same people that we use and we don't say nothing about the quick gay choir director because he's good for business as long as the choir sound good I ain't saying nothing about his sexuality We have done what the slave master did to us, dehumanize us, uh, degrade us, demonize us, but then use them for our advantage. I think that was a great response to the, um, the other Georgia pastor who was uh, demonizing and <coughs> talking about internment camps. <coughs> um, so uh, one last uh, resource I wanted to show here is um, not that one, this one. Can you see that? Welcome in resources. Yes. Okay. So what um, <clears throat> I was really um, just uh, heart sick about Jessica losing her faith community and I'm realizing how important that was and a lot of her friendships her kids friendships were embedded in that, in that community and she had to, to recreate all of that while dealing with the trauma and figuring out ways to protect her kid. So the resources here are wonderful. Find a welcoming congregation in Africa, Australia, and if you go to the United States, and then you click down, you can see by state. And if you if you go to uh, Washington and you go and you type in the uh, zip code, you can find um, your community. You can find welcoming, inclusive communities in Washington, Oregon, wherever throughout the United States. That's so nice. Oh, it is so wonderful, and we'll put that link into the um, <clears throat> in, into our resource. Yeah, our resource guide. You got it. Well, we will always include a little resource at the end uh, for everybody for all of these good things, and and even the ones you know that are not so good that maybe you want to take a closer look at. <laughs> right. Um, so uh, one last thing, um, and that is um, this last slide here. see did i share that oh you you stopped sharing okay zoom is so fun isn't it yeah well you're getting you're getting the hang of it you did you did yeah, some okay. fancy stuff there david i don't okay. know okay okay here we go so this last slide well it unshared oh goodness I'm, gracious be nice to the zoom gods i <laughs> Can you see that? No. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Okay. And now we'll sh share again. Share screen again. Okay. Now. Now, can you see that? I yes. Okay. Last slide. From current slide. There we go. So this is one. This is a wonderful movement <clears throat> that's happening. Um, one of the things again about LBGTQ, LBGTQ plus um, psychology is the acceptance and being able to be who they are. And uh, they, uh, people encounter this issue when they go into uh, for um, appointments in doctor's offices, when they try to travel and this and traveling um, out of the country is especially uh, challenging sometimes um, to have the the persona that you want on your passport or on your ID. Mm -hmm. So globally, multiple countries are legally recognizing non-binary or third gender classifications and have already introduced X gender passports. That's great. In 2019 in Canada. Yeah, it's, it's just. Whoa, how progressive, how wonderful. So in 2019, Canada introduced gender neutral passports with an X category. In Argentina, Australia, Denmark, and the Netherlands, Germany, Malta, New Zealand, Pakistan, and India, and Nepal, they already have a third category. So I guess it's about time for us in the United States to get on that. Get on board. Get on board. Yeah. You know, I love this, David, too, because the, the whole normalizing thing is a, as an antidote to the traumatizing thing. <clears throat> yes. One of my favorite shows is um, that one that just ended that's called Shit's Creek. 
Oh, and yeah. Made, yeah. I love that show. And it won all kinds of awards, not for like trying to be preachy and saying, you know, shame on you or anything, you know, you need to do this and get with it or, but instead by creating, uh, as you, as you probably know from, from watching it, just the, these normal, incredibly touching, beautiful, um, relationships where they didn't focus on it being in any way strange. It was like, Hey, there's, there's male, female, and then you got this other one X pick one. It's okay. Just pick another one. Maybe there's five, maybe there's six. There's room for everybody. It's like the children on the playground before they get eight, before they get this message that, no, you can't do that because you're a girl or you're a boy or I don't know what you are. You're confusing me and that threatens me and makes me scared. So no, you can't play. The playground's big enough for all of us. <laughs> uh, and it's wonderful to play with other people in that way. <clears throat> we have a lot, a lot of fun. This, um, <clears throat> so, uh, I peripherally am involved with the faith community. I, I uh, used to be a member of the Unitarian Universalist community here in Vancouver and actually taught <clears throat> the Universalist sex education course for one year, um, which was very anatomically cl correct progressive. This was back in 91, so it's, it's a while back. But, um, and uh, it was wonderful to have these discussions with kids and they would say, do our parents know we're talking about this? You know? <laughs> so, and um, and hopefully that conversation now can come into the schools in an appropriate way now that we've, we've passed referendum 90. And a lot of the concern about referendum 90 was the LBGTQ plus uh, issue in the schools. And um, so the, um, I, <clears throat> So did you know that um, in 12, 12, 7 of this year, 2020, the Supreme Court des declined to take an appeal from the Dallas, Dallas, Oregon parents group who want transgender, that, who want transgender students in their school district to use locker rooms and bathrooms based on their sex assigned at birth. So that was the lawsuit, right? Went to the Supreme Court, I uh, went to the appeals court, the appeals court said, well, law seems fine, but they went up the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said a policy that allows transgender students to use school bathroom and locker facilities that match their self-identified gender in the same manner that cisgender, that means physiologically, um, biologically uh, uh, gender, students utilize facilities that does not infringe on the 14th Amendment policy or parental rights or First Amendment free exercise rights, nor does it create actionable sex harassment under Title for, uh, Title 19, Judge A. Wallace Tashima of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals wrote. So the Supreme Court turned it back, said, don't see anything to be an issue here. And in Washington, we're gonna start having these conversations, age appropriate in schools, so people can normalize that and not be bullied and seen as other than, and can be appreciated for their uniqueness. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. It well, and it's, it's especially vexing to me because the idea that education brings about bad choices when we have so <laughs> much evidence to the contrary, just saying no without having education in order to form the ability to have informed consent doesn't work with drugs, doesn't work with sex, doesn't work, right? I mean, we've got enough, we've got enough data, we've got enough evidence on this. Prohibition never works. No. That's the forbidden fruit, right? So right. another little detail that I thought was great, that in 2020, gen, the 2020 general election we just had, voters elected six transgender candidates to state office. Wow, yay. And there, <clears throat> there was uh, several before that as well. So there's openly gay, you know, Pete Buttigieg is not gonna be the Secretary of Transportation, right? That's the first. Um, so we have all this wonderful diversity coming uh, coming forward, being brought forward. And- um, Boy, do we need it. We, we need it. Uh, we need all hands on deck. We need everybody helping out to figure out how we're gonna move forward and have a, 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 a group of diverse problem solvers working on the issues that face us and bring us together. Um, amen. That's beautifully said, David. 
think so. Um, anything else that we need to? Oh, one one last thing. Um, I encourage people to read Karl Popper's book, The Open Society and Its Enemies. Um, one of the things he says. Now, this this is this is a little bit edgy. Um, he says, if we extend unlimited tolerance even to those who are intolerant, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society, in other words, be allies against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed and tolerance will then, and tolerance with them. So we should claim that any movement preaching the into intolerance places itself outside the law. Okay, does that mean then we we should be tolerating everything but the intolerant? We we should be in dialogue with everything and with the intolerant realize that there's no reasoning there to engage with and that it is a weaponized process and that you need we need to protect ourselves and also the community from <clears throat> weaponizing uh, intolerance. Mm -hmm. It's uh in psychology, they call it the uh, dominance of the minority pop population uh, or, or the minority position. Uh, so they, they take over and uh, the minority position in the community takes over and, and decides because they have the power, which is happening, uh, mm -hmm. of course, in the United States. 70 percent uh, in 2015, 70 percent of the population in the United States were supportive of the LBGTQ plus lifestyles. No if, ands, or buts, gay marriage, no if, ands, or buts, sex education, no if, ands, or buts. By 2019, that, that decreased to 69% because Republicans were moving, were moving to the traditional position of, of demonizing um, and, and ostracizing LBGTQ plus communities. Mm -hmm. So this is the work we have to do. Um, and here in Vancouver, we have some resources and uh, helpful people and allies to uh, to join with in that effort. Absolutely. And David, it's I think it's important too to recognize that minority doesn't mean the tyranny of the majority over less numbers. The way that you're depicting it and from what I understand you saying is it's a very um, parsed view that because it is it is undergirded with falsehood. <coughs> and pushed forward as a legitimate opinion. And then it is used to lord over and weaponize people who do have tolerance. And that's the aspect of the tyranny, right? That's, that's exactly right. Thank you for um, fleshing that out. Yes. <laughs> Just so I understand. <laughs> right, yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to say. Right, good, good job. So um, anything else? That Want to add that, that? That, that's it. I mean, you know, this is our addendum to the wonderful first two shows. And, um, you know, we're going to continue on. We have so many fascinating and uh, please don't hate us. Uh, you know, we, 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 we really do want to come from a place of taking these really big issues that are scary and bringing them down to Vancouver and, and having uh, open hearted, open minded, um, fact based discussions on them. And, um, you know, we welcome all people and right, we're, we are completely tolerant of everything except intolerance that is based on <laughs> irrational hatred and, and uh, used to weaponize and, and wield uh, power over people who are vulnerable. So please come back. Yes. <laughs> and uh, just to put a pin in it, uh, the, we may do a future show on the, uh, and really look closely at the uh, religious bigotry going on in the United States. I mean, this we just touched on it, <clears throat> but we wanted this to show as a background, but we can get into that and bring in local people to talk about that in the future. Oh boy, that's gonna be fun. Yeah, I've been wanting to do that for a while. <laughs> Me too, David, yeah. oh boy. Okay. All right, my dear, well, thank you so much. It's a beautiful day. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, David's gonna go do his uh, walk and I'm gonna do mine. and. We're going to be masked up because we're still in COVID. That's where we are today, but we have a virus. Uh, almost a new year. So uh, thanks for joining us on Cool Coove, and please stay tuned. We have so much more to share with you. Stay cool and stay curious.